Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Irina Karagar here, and we are back with our next episode of the Business Case for Polkadot in partnership with Polkadot Blockchain Academy. And it is my pleasure to introduce you today our special guest, Mario Scrotton, an innovator, founder and CEO of Linked Car, Linked Car, and an alumni of Polkadot Blockchain Academy Wave 4 in Hong Kong. So Linked Car is democratizing, tokenizing vehicle data through blockchain, empowering drivers with ownership and control, and driving innovation in the automotive industry. Mario is just back from Hong Kong, uh, where he had, um, I hope, great time and experience uh, interacting with Polkadot community, with other students, PBA, um, other parachain teams. And I'm very excited to bring Mario on stage with us. Hello, Mario. Hello, hello. And Mario, please introduce yourself to our audience. We are uh, very curious about your journey and about how did you fell into this rabbit hole of Web3 and especially what brought you to the Polkadot community uh, and the academy. Okay. Um... So you know that I live in Belgium, which is uh, all the all a strange uh, country. Now uh, I've started already some companies in the old Web2 world, and it's actually by accident that I stumbled across the Web3 world. Um, a few years ago, and you will laugh probably with that, I said I will never ever do anything with blockchain, never. The reason for that was I looked at it pure from a technical point of view. I looked at data writing speed in a database and you know it, it takes 12 seconds on a blockchain to write something. And in the IT world, that's eternal. We, we talk about microseconds. But look at me now, alumni from the Hong Kong part. So I rolled into this Web3 world. And um, to be honest, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, First, uh, there was a conversation with the Belgian government because I wanted to have some inspection certificates of cars. Um, I spoke with everyone, even the minister, and then at the end, they were all positive. Uh, there was one person that needs to say it's a yes or no. That was the data protection officer, and they said no. The main reason was I wanted to build something on AWS, and they thought, hey, this is an American company. So I thought, hmm, I need to change this. So that's one check. Now, after that, uh, a couple of things were happening in the, uh, in, regarding personal data wallets. Uh, I live in Belgium, in the Flanders part, and they started an initiative which is called SOLID. And SOLID is by uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, and Sir Tim Berners-Lee is actually the inventor of the uh, HTML pages that we know from the internet. So uh, Flanders was pouring a lot of money in that uh, solid thing. So I thought, hmm, I need to look at that as well, decentralized. Now, um, what I think is why I switched to Web3, the most important thing is, um, and we need to be honest about that, society is changing. Um, I think people are becoming way more aware of data, of personal data. And big companies like, you know, Google uh, has now a feature where you can turn off location history. Uh, Facebook makes it now possible to request your entire history. And so many features have been created. And OK, thanks to the lobbying of the EU. And it makes it now possible to own your own data. And we become more aware of this. And I just wanted to do the same thing for uh, vehicle data. Um, but to be honest, in the beginning, I had no idea technically how we could fit this uh, together. Uh, and that's, by the way, also the reason why I went to the founders track of the PBA to figure out how can we make this possible on a technical level. And um, Mario, how was your experience uh, at PBA? So as a founder, right, you did you just have an idea about what you want to build or did you already have a developed product and MVP or a product with traction and how was this transition because you mentioned that uh, you were already an established entrepreneur in web 2 um, yeah. so how did you transition from that web 2 idea into web 3 and what were the missing links uh, that you 
when to look for in the PBA? Yeah. So first of all, I started with the idea. I had no real big technical idea how we could solve this in the Web3 world. It took me also, I think, three weeks or something uh, together with some developers to figure out how can we solve this. Um, so that's one important thing, right? So um, your other question is, how is it a little bit different, the Web2 and the Web3 uh, world? Uh, so why is it that I really want to go to the Web3 world? Um, I think... I, th I think the decentralization, the trust thing, those things were really, really, really important. Now, um, for me, honestly, it was a big shift to go from the Web 2 to the Web 3 world. And it's all because of the Web 3 world themselves, a little bit. You know, I've been a little bit older and I've been, been a little bit longer in this industry. And I know when you want to do something new, um, you use new terms to say the same thing, but you want to explicitly say this is new. This is not like in the old world. Um, I remember someone telling me, hey, we, mean, we need to mint an NFT. And I thought, mint? What the heck is this? And the only thing that he wants to say is we want to create an NFT. So we, we use the same word. Uh, we use a different word, but we, do, we mean the same thing. Same thing with, uh, you know, when you start developing, you mentioned crate or palette. And then I think what happened with words like library or subroutine or something like that, or smart contracts for me is that if then else. So there is a shift uh, in ter terminology when you go from web two into the web three uh, world, to be honest. Uh, so I can imagine that can be quite challenging for web three, uh, web two uh, people to step into the web three world. Uh, I had the same thing. Um, another thing that I found quite interesting and surprisingly was that in the Web3 world, um, you see that many partners are more or less, I call it pain for using the product, right? There are so many grants, bounties, so many possibilities to build your own product. I've never seen this actually in the Web2 world. So if you're like me and, you want, and you're a founder and you're, thinking about doing something in the Web3 world, I think you will find this quite attractive. And um, what I always say to Web2 founders is uh, try to look beyond, beyond difficult words, right? Um, if you don't understand, ask. I do that all, I did that all the time at the PBA as well. Um, I have, by the way, a funny story about that. Um, and, you know, even if you looked at blockchain a couple of years ago, like I did, and I told you in the very beginning that I would never use uh, blockchain, have a look at it again, because I feel it's really matured. A lot of things have, have changed, and it's way more than only financial applications. That is, that is not the case anymore. So um, shall I tell you quickly the funny thing that happened to me at the PBA? So... Um. Yes, because we are uh, we are very curious about what happens at PBA real time, and of course we shared your pictures with Dr. Gavin Wood, with Pauline, uh, with with the Academy. So we are very curious, and our audience is very curious to know what is it like to be emerged uh, to share the same room, to share the same space, to exchange experience because you had the opportunity that not many people get to really have that first-hand experience and talk to the founder of one of the most advanced ecosystems, uh, a person who invented basically a term, coined the term Web3, and who is really advocating for decentralization uh, and transformation in our society and our technology, building this unstoppable supercomputer polka dot. So, Tell us more about this, please. Well, everyone, everyone will say probably that a PBA is amazing, and I will say the same thing. But um, I would also want to say that I remember my first week in Hong Kong during the PBA, we talked about cryptographic, right? Cryptography. 
Um, and I was thinking after three days, what am I doing here? And, um, and, and that's basically what I like. It's not an easy uh, subject, um, but uh, what I like about the PBA, they set the bar really, really high. And that's normal because all expenses are being paid by Polkadot, so I liked it a lot. And um, what is really, really, really good is that they bring founders and developers together. Now, um, why do I think that's really, really good? Because every developer, they want, want to have a challenging project. Every founder, they want to have a really good developer. So the networking part is really, really fantastic. And um, many developers have often sat with me at the whiteboard, figuring out how we can technically solve the link car solution. And they were really, really willing to do that. And, I'm, and until today, I'm still really, really grateful for them to do that. Now, and on the other hand, I've also helped almost all founders and even some developers with their pitch or their light paper of the project. And, and that's really, really good about the PBA. You sit together for five weeks, four or five weeks, and you're so close together that the willingness to help each other is really, really there. And I, I mean, and I can truly say that real friendships start over there even if we're across different nations countries whatever another background it it feels like a like a true friendship um and i'm also grateful for them that they you know i was i was the oldest one in in the group but um there was so much respect um, and I always lost, uh, I always laughed uh, with them that I said, well, my knowledge about Web3 was uh, zero proof, <laughs> that I had no zero knowledge. Um, but the fun part was actually, uh, you know, I, I was there day one or day two. And, um, and uh, people come, came up to me and they said, hey, GM. And I thought, hmm. I had here a sticker with my name. Hey, my name is, is Mario. So you understand what my general knowledge was of, of blockchain and, and Web3 in, ge in general. It was not so high. But if you do that PBA, that's, that's really, really good. You, you learn indeed difficult things. You struggle through it. You learn what true friendship is. You help each other. I mean, this is really, really, really unseen. If you think it's a holiday because we're sitting in Hong Kong and there are, there are ways to go out, whatever, you're totally wrong. There is a lot of things to do, but it's so rewarding, so rewarding. And even today, I'm now back for two weeks, I think, from Hong Kong. I still speak with people from the developer side or from the founder side uh, that I met in, in Hong Kong. So I think there is a true friendship there. This is amazing. And I always say yes. on this podcast that Polkadot is about community. Polkadot is the largest world DAO. Now with the introduction of the open governance, uh, there is so much more activity also because the DOD holders are active network participants. They have a stake. They have a say. They are actively yeah. participating in the governance and taking decisions on, uh, well, there is a technical fellowship that uh, is overlooking all the technical upgrades, updates, and developments of the network. Uh, there are multiple collectives now introduced uh, and multiple community members proposing their initiatives as well as we have bounties and what you, Mario, said before about funding opportunities. Um, I want to bring this up because this is very important value that Web3 gives to the founders who are looking to maybe have just an idea or a prototype or looking for team members and, and funding, we have Decentralized Futures program. It's a funding yes. program uh, recently launched by Web3 Foundation, 40 million Swiss franc and 5 million DOT available for builders. Uh, so please check it out, submit your application. It's very easy uh, process. And we also have multiple bounties in the ecosystem. So you can apply for business development initiatives, events, uh, marketing, and all that can be founded in a decentralized and transparent way on chain. And this is an unprecedented uh, initiative or rather set of initiatives that uh, we have in Polkadot because 
decentralization is power to the people. So everybody's empowered in this ecosystem. Every single voice counts. And we all stand for uh, these values that were initially uh, drafted or presented in the Polkadot white paper. So I also recommend those who are not familiar with Polkadot to read the white paper. Uh, it's very, very interesting. And Mario, from the experience, like you said, it was very difficult. Well, not very difficult. It's, it's an intense program. So how intense is intense? What is the structure? Do you have classes? Do you have homework? Um, how does the program run? Yeah. So, um, so first of all, you sit in a kind of event room. Huh? Uh, every day from, I think it started at, sometimes it started at 8 in the morning. That was pretty, pretty early. But most of the time, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, and it ends around 5 or 6 in the evening, right? So it's pretty intensive. So that's the reason that I say if you think it's a holiday, you're completely wrong. Um, it is quite interactive, so you learn a lot of stuff, you can use it, you can discuss with, uh, even I was doing that with some of the developers, what do you think about this, how does this work, etc. And then, um, and uh, and that's also good, at the end of every week, uh, there is a kind of, they call it quiz, right? But it's actually a kind of exam to see how good you, you followed whatever what was being told during the entire week. Now, um, people think, is, is, that, is that a good thing or a bad thing uh, to have a kind of quiz? It's actually a good thing. That's the only way how you know what your level is and also how the PBA can know what your level is. Uh, if something is uh, wrong, you need some extra help, whatever. So I think it's, it's, it's really, really good. That also means, I mean, uh, most of the time the exam was on, uh, on a Saturday, so you still need to study. Like I said, it's not it's it's not a holiday, but at the end, it's really really rewarding. For us as a founder, we had a lot of um, uh, let's say um, uh, uh, theoretical theoretical stuff from in the very beginning. I think the first two two weeks and a half, and later on, we had more things uh, for for founders. How do we like you mentioned, uh, there is a lot of money going around in the Web3 world. How does that work? How does um, the market work? How, how do we do some things with tokenization? Um, uh, open Guff, what's that? So all the things that are really, really important to build your business in the blockchain world are being explained then. And then you see also a split between the developers and the founders. So the founders, they get more thing like uh, how do you do a pitch? Uh, how, how's the market? That kind of stuff. While the developers are more into Rust and Substrate and Frame and smart contracts, they go deeper in in uh, in a technical uh, in a technical level. And Mario, speaking about uh, technical level, uh, what is the value you find uh, in the Polkadot architecture and tech stack? Uh, why did you decide that Polkadot will be the best ecosystem for Linkit Card to build it in? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, people ask me that all the time. Um, and this was also by coincidence. Uh, by coincidence, and then you, did, you, did, you do some uh, own homework, and then you figure out what the reason is that Polkadot is actually the best. So first, um, the funny thing is, it started with a developer language, and in my case, it was uh, Rust. So uh, I figured out that I want to do something with Linkcar with the Rust programming language, and then I saw that Polkadot is using that a lot. Um, and oh no, I now make it now I make it myself really difficult. There was one important thing that was that really stood out. Uh, but it's so hard for me to pronounce uh, what is really important within Polkadot. It's interoper interoperability. Oh, damn. I will do it again. Interoperability. Yeah, right. So um, if you look... It's in, all about uh, XEM, guys. It's all about <laughs> XEM. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Indeed. So um, when you look in uh, what is happening in uh, in Europe, they also speak about that. 
that is really, really important for them. So, um, you know, that was a real plus when I saw that within Polkadot. So no borders between blockchains. Perfect. Um, and I also saw many advantages with scalability within uh, within Polkadot. Um, and I think if you uh, if you combine that, oh, and there was another thing as well. Um, I came across that nice built ecosystem of Polkadot. So um, you, f you find there are partners that already built something on Polkadot. They have beautiful applications or add-on add-ons that you can easily use in your own product. So that was also a real plus uh, for me. And um, who are the partners that you already probably have in a pipeline or who are the ecosystem teams that you are looking to partner for? So uh, how can Polkadot ecosystem, because now we have um, our community teams, parachain teams, application, uh, other team members of uh, um, you know, developers who are, who are watching us. So who is your ideal partner uh, in the ecosystem? Yeah. So um, first of all, before I mention who is the ideal partner, because I, I think there cannot be one ideal partner, to be honest. Um, but, but before I address that, I want to say that I really, really like the openness of all partners within the ecosystem, how they, um, you know, have a communication with us, how they address different things, how they are willing to help us to figure out what is the best way to do certain things on a technical level, right? Um, the reason why I say this is because um, I'm used to something else. Um, in the Web2 world, it's not so common that you're so open to help one each other. Uh, I speak with, when I talk with the partners of the Polkadot ecosystem, I speak very rapidly to the CEOs, to the founders of that same uh, company. That is pretty, pretty rare, rare in the Web2 world. And all of them, no exception, are willing to help. So they figure out, okay, what is the best way to do this? And even if they... If, if there is no fit with their product, right, they help you and they introduce you to other partners. So for me, that's already really, really important. Now, um, if I look at, um, and probably I will forget a couple of them, but if I look at partners that, uh, that can really help us, uh, I think the first one is uh, Tanzi. Um, when I, um, when I just joined the PBA, I thought, you know, building an app chain is quite easy to do, right? You have the polka dots and, and you build something, uh, on top of that. How difficult can it be? Oh boy, I was wrong. Um, and then you have nice products like Tanzi that just come along and they, they nailed all the real difficult part and you can focus on your own products. Yeah, I like it. So that's a good thing. Um, and then, you know, we also use uh, NFTs. Um, so we, we think about uh, working together with uh, Unic, Unic Network. Um, there are others as well. Uh, Nodal is one of them as well, because they all also have experience in, uh, in the Web2 and the Web3 world. So there are a lot of partners that can help. Um, but what I like the most, like I said in the very beginning, is that all partners are so open. And I can't stress it out enough because that's something that in the Web2 world is, is not there anymore. I doubt even if it, if it even was once there. So the world of competition becoming the world of co competition or cooperation, right? Yeah, I think so. Would you say that? Yeah, I think so. Because I think we all believe that uh, in the new Web3 world, there's a lot of things for everyone. Right. Um, in the oh, you see in the Web two world is um, there are a lot of applications and then people create a kind of subversion of that application. Here, the opportunity in the Web three world is huge because there are there are still a lot of things that can be built, and um, it's better to help each other because that will help 
the, block, uh, the blockchain world, but also the Polkadot world. So even if a partner has created a product that not is not immediately a fit in, in my world, for a linked car I mean, then still they want to help you to stay in the Polkadot ecosystem and help another partner in the in the Polkadot ecosystem, uh, to, you know, to introduce them to you. So that's really, really strong, I must admit. And um, Mario, going back to your product and your solution, um, I would like to dive a little deeper into your product uh, or is it a product or is a product or a service and product and a service together? So how does the model look like and uh, how do you di differentiate yourself from other companies on the market? Why is your solution important for the society? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the reason why it is important for society is because um, there is a lot of unfairness. Uh, that's the reason also why I built this uh, company. There is a lot of unfairness when, it's, when we talk about vehicle data ownership. What I mean with that is today when you buy a, a new car, you actually also signed up for an agreement with your car manufacturer that all the data goes directly to your car manufacturer. And um, they can do with the data whatever they want. So you don't need to give any consent anymore. They can sell your personal data to anyone. They make a, a lot of money. Uh, it's estimated, McKinsey estimated this, that it's uh, 750 billion US dollar for the car manufacturers as a kind of extra revenue. So that is huge, really, really huge. So for me, that this is completely unfair, right? Uh, you buy a car, you think you own everything, but in the end, you don't own the data that is being gathered by the car manufacturer. And, you know, when I tell this to people, people say, yeah, all right, data from a car, what you know? What will they have from us? Huh? Mileage? Huh? How fast am I driving? Pff, who cares? Well, there is a huge thing going on that um, they even track, and I don't know how they do it, but they even track your sexual activity uh, in a car. I mean, huh? not outside a car. <laughs> so I don't know how they do that. But uh, if you want to know more about this, Mozilla is um, a famous research organization, and they did a research, I think, somewhere in September of October, and they tested all the car manufacturers, and they said the result was the, um, all, the, the, the cars are actually a privacy nightmare. That's it. And they tested lots of things, and you know the conclusion was it's a nightmare. Then you can better go to Google and our Facebook, because previously we were afraid of them about our data, but the cars are way, way worse. Now, uh, and that's actually the reason why I started this company. I want to uh, address this unfairness. You know, everyone thinks, hey, I own a car and, um, um, you know, I have all the data, but it's actually the opposite. It's not, it's not true, right? So that's basically what I want, uh, want to do. I want to uh, change this and that the vehicle owner is actually also, so the driver is also the owner of the data. Now, there's one thing that I want to say is, um, you know, when we started this, uh, we first had um, some round tables to discuss, also some car manufacturers uh, were in there. And um, when we talked about this, uh, the car manufacturer first thought, uh, hey, you guys will be a competitor uh, uh, because uh, they also have information in a mobile app about their car and we do the same. Uh, but we see our app actually as uh, complementary. What I mean with that is, um, you know, in the app that we have, you can add multiple cars, brands, but our focus is really, really data. So we will never control your car from the app so you cannot open the door, uh, turn on the heating, um, that kind of stuff. That's just not our focus. Our focus is data. And that means that if you want to control your car opening and turn on the heating and whatever, 
you can do that with the app from the car manufacturer. But if you want to do a little bit more with the data from a car, then you need to be with our application. Now, um, perhaps I can tell you also a little bit uh, more about uh, the data, how much value that it brings to you and potentially also because most people ask this to me uh yeah you say 750 billion the common factor why the heck would he ever give away the data to you right that is really really strange right so um when i started two years ago uh, two years ago, I first went to the car manufacturers and I had this brilliant idea about giving away data to the car to the vehicle owners. Uh, and they said, of course, no. Of course, because 750 billion, uh, you will never give that away. Now, something really interesting has changed now. And uh, I'm really thankful for the EU. Sometimes they do some great stuff. This is just such a case. Um, they have now something which is called the EU Data Act. And the EU Data Act is uh, an act that has been signed by all EU members. It is uh, effective from last November. And it forces all IoT companies to uh, give away their data for free to the consumer. So that also means car manufacturers. So... Um, and um, what we want to achieve now, because we talk with many car manufacturers, is that they see us as a kind of ally, because um, we will make sure that they comply with the law to give away the data to the consumers, and we make sure that they get that uh, without extra costs. So we get all the data from the car manufacturer, we put it on the platform, and you as a driver can have um, ownership, actually, of that data. Now, what I think is really, really good is that we pay also back the originator of the data. What I mean with that is, so the car manufacturer is giving away mileage. You as a driver are sharing mileage to your car insurer because you can get a discount for for your next car uh, for your next insurance contract. So that means that we pay a portion back to the um, uh, originator of the data, and in this case, it's the car manufacturer. Now imagine that the insurer gives away the start and the end date of the contract, and the lease company is interested uh, if your car is insured, and you give away the start and the end rate. Then we also pay a portion back to the originator of the data, and in this case, the insurer. That's basically how it goes. Now, for the driver, because I'm talking now on the business side, for the driver, as soon as you start sharing data, you also get paid. You get tokens. Now, how does that work? It does work like this. Um, you know, we collect data from different sources. It could be from the car manufacturer, it could be from a lease company, it could be from an insurer, and we give it all to you on your mobile device. If you are interested to monetize that data, and I'm not talking about all data, I'm talking about small pieces of data, we have a kind of marketplace, smart contracts, where, um, you know, an insurance company, a lease company, a charging station, whatever, can go to and say, well, if you give me the mileage every month or every day, I will give you one token or two tokens or three tokens whatsoever. So um, you can go to that ecosystem and you can say, I'm interested in sharing this kind of data, this kind of data, this kind of data. So you can build actually your own passive income, let's call it that way, um, with data that you own today, right? So we don't change anything. We just make sure that all those data silos, we break them down. You become now the sole owner of that data. And there is, an, there is a kind of um, you know, system, um, a marketplace where you can go and you can say, what do they offer for my data? And it's only that small piece of data that are being shared. And that's basically what we do. So on a functional level, it's quite easy. We collect data from different sources. We put it in one, one place. You can share the data to anyone you want, and you monetize the data that you share. That's basically it.
Uh, and Mario, do you see European Union as um, the best environment for this kind of application because of the regulations in place, because of the existing ecosystem, because of the European Union funding and programs? Uh, and do you plan to expand your solution to other markets? Like, say, Asia is very popular uh, this year, many Web3 communities and ecosystems are doing events, including uh, Polkadot. Uh, actually, if you are watching us uh, from Asia, there is Sub-Zero this year happening in Thailand. Please check it out, uh, Sub-Zero page. So yeah, well, are you are you planning to be also present there and sort of what what is the timeline if that's the case? Yeah. First of all, let's start with the, with the EU. Um, I think I think it's that uh, you talked about the regulations. I think it's uh, they have a lot of regulations, uh, as you probably know. There is also a GDPR thing going on, and GDPR and blockchain are not really best friends. Um, but if you start in the EU, well, it's 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 the, the regulation is there, so you know the framework where you need to concentrate on. That means that it's probably more difficult to start something in the EU because you have those regulations. But if you do it really, really well, GDPR, uh, this new thing, EU Data Act, you have a really good base to go everywhere. So, and of course, we're looking at US, Asia, etc. cetera. Um, but the, the main reason why we first start with the EU is because the act that is now being in place, it's called the EU Data Act. It's not called the US Data Act. It's not called the Asian Data Act. It's called the EU Data Act. And that's something that is really needed to force the car manufacturer to give away the data, right? So if we make that really, really successful, um, we can go quite easily to any other country, um, Asia, Africa, whatever, it's, it's all possible. Now, there are two other things that I want to mention about the EU. Um, the EU is doing now, to be honest, quite great work in everything that has to do with regulations. Um, they are building now something else, which is, called, which is a, a kind of digital wallet where you can store also your driving license in there. Uh, it's called the EU ID. So the EU ID. So it's a digital identity for all Europeans uh, where um, a lot of things are stored, but also the driver license. Now, that is, for our use case, great, because we can link them the driver license with our application. So that will be a little bit the authentication, right? Who are you? Um, but the possibilities at the end are really, really big. I imagine that you step out of the airport, you want to rent a car, you can share digitally your driving license and also digitally your driving history. That means you can get a personal quote to rent the car. I mean, that would be super. That's one thing. And uh, lastly, what I want to say is, you know, we talk now a lot, of, a, a lot of, about cars. Uh, it's not so strange because our company is called Linked Car. Um, but you know that the EU Data Act is for every IoT device. And we will never focus on every IoT device. We are focused on uh, you know, mobility, and that will be our focus also. But uh, e-bikes, they are also connected. We can do the same thing with e-bikes. So as soon as you start driving, that you own the data and you can share data as well. You can also share that then, for instance, with your insurance company or with your employer, because in Belgium you get paid for every mile that you drive with your uh, to go to the work with your with your bike. That's also a possibility. So I think we have lots of possibilities. So yes, we start first with the EU because we have the EU Data Act, so we have something. Uh, in our sleeves to go to the car manufacturer. Um, and, and, and yes, there are a lot of regulations also regarding GDPR, etc. But to be honest, that helps us also a little bit. You have then a legal framework to work on. And then it's really, really easy to go to Asia and to US, to, to the US, because 
they are more easy to work with. And Mario, in terms of um, blockchain infrastructure, right, since we're talking about data and some of that data can be very sensitive or personal and maybe people do not want to share this data publicly. And we're talking about Polkadot, which is a public permissionless blockchain and everybody can see your transactions, um, all the requests, all the movements that a, a single wallet um, can create. So how do you address this? And what is the actual uh, position of, let's say, EU uh, initiatives um, in, in regards to using public blockchains? Because I know that there is a blockchain initiative by the European Union. So they, they're sort of building their own blockchain. So how the two or multiple blockchain ecosystems can coexist and um, would the public blockchain uh, actually prevail uh, in your forecast? And uh, what is the biggest benefit of ecosystems uh, like Polkadot for, for closed systems? Yeah, a lot of questions. <laughs> um, I'll try to answer them. So, um, first of all, you're right. Um, the um, information that you put on a blockchain is public, except if you hash them and you store the data somewhere else, right? Um, that, is, that is also a possibility. Um, what we don't do and we will never do is put any personal data, uh, your name, birth date and whatever, on the blockchain. Uh, the reason is it is just not allowed with GDPR. So <laughs> if I ever have an application like this, uh, I think they will not be so happy. That's the reason that we look at applications like Solid or applications like what is now happening with a digital wallet, the EU ID. Um, now, and then you have data from a car. Now, when we communicate with different mobility partners, we will never talk that uh, we will never talk in a person we always use the VIN number of a car that's the main DID uh, the ID of, uh, of the car now um, and then we are also pretty cautious what we put openly on a blockchain there are some things that um, are really really helpful to put on a blockchain mileage for instance is such an example because mileage is if if you want to uh, control the, the real mileage of a car and you have then a digital proof, it will help you later on to sell the car. And, you know, you can prove this is actually the mileage of the car. Maintenance, same thing, right? Um, but there are some things that you never, ever can put on a, on a blockchain. Um, uh, imagine that we get which is not the case right now, but imagine that we get information from the insurance company where they say you, um, you were in fault of an accident and you need to pay us or something like that. That's quite sensitive information. So we don't put that on a blockchain. We keep that off chain um, because we realize that what we're building over here with Link Car, not everything can be on chain. That is just not realistic. I give another example. We get from the car manufacturer also um, GPS coordinates. So every minute we know where you are. This is just stupid to put that on a blockchain because we will kill the blockchain uh, if we do that. It doesn't make, and we will kill us because it, it costs way too much money. So we will never do that. That doesn't make any sense. Does it make sense to keep that information Yes, not for a long time, but it could be of interest to keep that information uh, for a certain period of time. So um, when we were in the PBA, someone mentioned uh, the word Web 2.5, <laughs> which is in between the two and a three. And um, that could be the case that, um, that we're working on this, a Web 2.5 solution. Um, because for regulation, some of the things are not possible. And there's also one other remark that I want to add, and that helps the Web, web 2.5. You know that we work with tokenization, right? So there is a kind of flow of tokens. You own data and you get tokens from an insurance company or roadside assistance, whatever that you do. And uh, it's kind of flow, constant flow. I call it closed loop tokenization. 
Um, but we still need to convince an insurance company or um, uh, a bank or whatever that provides a loan for, for this car to open up a wallet. So there are still some struggles that we need to uh, need to take. So that's the reason that I think Web 2.5 is perhaps the best word for now before we completely go into the Web 3 world. Uh, I found that quite interesting, that, uh, that talk on the PBA. And how far do you think we are from the Web 3, real Web 3 world? How do you see this space developing in the next sort of five to 10 years? And also considering that Apple just launched their special computing and the metaverse became a thing and is getting the new momentum and also uh, we are in a in this in the market conditions when uh, tokens are gaining more value so companies are more excited the vcs are more excited about investment in web3 but uh what about the adoption where yeah what is your prediction for the next cycle cycle um i think that um Web3 is becoming more mature. Uh, previously, it was all about crypto. That is not the case anymore, especially when I look at what happened in the, at the PBA and I saw the projects that were being done, it's becoming more mature, right? Um, what I also believe is why Web3 will win is everything that has to do with uh, ownership of data. Ownership of, of data will become more and more important and that automatically means also decentralized networks. Um, you know, users want to have control over their own data, and that's and that's uh, and that's obvious. Um, and um, you know, there will be more applications on a blockchain, more than just finance and and, and banking and DeFi. I think about uh, gaming. Uh, there are a lot of things. Uh, you know, applications moving towards blockchain. Uh, and what I also expect, and that's my personal opinion, I expect a lot from governments, to be honest. Because I see, I really, really feel that uh, we're, we're opening up now a new market that is quite mature. In the very beginning, it was, I call it Spielerei of Deutsch. Um, you know, a couple of things to try and error. And, and now, Companies are way more mature, but governments are not following this. And that is normal. Uh, you know, when you think about DAOs, um, I have huge expectations for DAOs as well. Um, but legally, there are still a gray area for DAOs. And then, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, perhaps also uh, we're missing an awareness about the legal side of things, because if yes. we are onboarding people who are not uh, familiar with the regulatory situation in their country, well, they just never came you know, across this, uh, this need to learn more about uh, regulations around tokenization or data ownership. Uh, do you think organizations, communities uh, that are involved in Web3 should push more on education and uh, legal education of um, founders, builders, developers? Uh, is it something important? Um, yes, it is important. It is important. It is, um, if you think, um, you know, let's start a company, have some, have some tokens, sell them, and then let's see what will happen. Uh, then you ruin it for everyone in this ecosystem. You're just ruining it. I think let's let's all show some maturity. Let's all show that we really mean what we do. We mean business. Um, let's get rid of the you know the, the the scam thing that is around the blockchain thing and the DeFi thing. Let's get rid of that, and let's let's organize ourselves. Let organize ourselves. Let's. You know, let's learn. The PBA is a really good example to do that, by the way. Huh? You have then legal courses there. Really, really, really good. Um, and this is just needed. You cannot start a company and don't know anything. If you just have a good technical idea, um, you know, you need to you need to learn a little bit more than just a technical idea. Um, that's my thing. And I think uh, we need to be educated as founders and as developers 
but we and as soon as we got we get bigger and bigger we can not force but we can also educate the government a little bit more what so because they also think oh yeah blockchain it's bitcoin it's and we know how it how it went so we need to educate them as well and take also the time to educate them as well because most of the time they are a little bit older and they're strict in whatever they do and all the regulations so please when you start something make it good uh, uh, use the pba for instance to learn uh, not only about how it is being done technically but also legally for instance market wise legally whatever that's my good advice i think and Mario, on this uh, on this note, uh, since we are heading towards the conclusion of our episode today, uh, by the way, if you're watching and you have questions, please let us know in the uh, in the comments below, uh, or if you want to reach out afterwards and have a deeper conversation on business uh, case Polkadot PBA, please do reach out to Mario and myself. True, sure. Mario, uh, to yes. all the aspiring founders who will be joining. Polkadot Blockchain Academy in Singapore for Wave 5, uh, for everybody who is looking to build in Polkadot ecosystem and in general for people for people who have Web2 business and they're looking to enter Web3, your message to aspiring entrepreneurs. Okay. <clears throat> uh, good question. Um, I think, uh, you know, Whatever you want to build, always start with the business case. If you build on the Web 2 or in the Web 3 world, start with the business case. And um, especially in the, with the business case, try to discuss this with a couple of people, see how it will work. Um, I remember at the PBA, there was one founder who completely adjusted his product based on the feedback he got from developers. So that's, and I'm still in contact with this guy. So that's, it's perfectly possible. So that's one good advice. Um, secondly, I think, um, look at the ecosystem. Look at the partners in the ecosystem, uh, what they already have built. And, um, and thirdly, I think, have also some patience. Uh, patience, what I mean with that is um, building something in the Web3 world requires a, a lot of thinking in the beginning, right? So like I mentioned, I'm in Europe, so you have GDPR legislation. Uh, so you really need to think about what you're building before you actually build something. Um, otherwise, it's a waste of time and, uh, and money. Um, and educate yourself i think that is the i think that is the most important thing if you are a developer and you think ah, i know how to uh, create code that's fine but that doesn't mean that you know how to build a company go to the pba uh, perhaps there are new founders uh, founders are looking for developers developers are looking for founders uh, talk communicate educate because only as a as only as one entire, and I truly mean this, only as one entire ecosystem, we can make the Web3 world what we really, really want. And that's the only way how we can rid of the, the whole thing about scam, etc. Take this really, really seriously and, and uh, you know, do your other best so we can accelerate. So, and if you accelerate, everyone within the Polkadot ecosystem or in the blockchain ecosystem can accelerate. So we need to have a couple of successes that people think, wow, this is really, really great. An application that we can understand and uh, you know, scale that really, really fast. Uh, that's all possible with Polkadot. So that's really, really, really good. But so if I talk with education, let's first start with a PBA for instance. Uh, that's a good start. Thank you, Mario. And if potential partners, community members want to reach out to you and want to follow uh, Linked Card, uh, what is the best way to reach out to you? Where should they follow you and write to you? Yes. 
So funny enough, um, I learned that Telegram is the best way to communicate, but I have a really funny name on Telegram, so don't use that. But um, go on LinkedIn, you know, that old Web2 application, it's still, used, it's still being used. Uh, type in my name, uh, send me a message, um, and I will definitely answer. Uh, but just don't click connect, and then let's see what will happen. Right, please write a message. Uh, and I will, I will always answer it. So I think that's the best way uh, to approach me. If you have any questions about, uh, most of the time, the business, the business side, right? To do something in Web3. If you want to know how uh, a palette works or Rust or something else, I don't speak Rust. So that's you don't need to talk with me. But anything else that has to do with business and how do you do that with tokenization and anything else, uh, you can reach to me. Thank you so much, Mario. This was very insightful conversation. Uh, we have business founder here. We're uncovering the business side of Polkadot, the business side of Web3, and think about your business case first. This is my takeaway from today's podcast. Thank you so much for joining us, Mario. And no uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are wrapping up. So please follow Polkadot Blockchain Academy. Um, this is the last day of uh, submitting your application for Singapore cohort. Uh, please follow the website uh, and LinkedIn page as well as the Twitter page of PBA to know the latest updates and to uh, receive information about cohort six, uh, which is also coming soon, right after the Singapore. Uh, and please, if you want to join Polkadot community, you can go to polkadot.network, uh, look for community official channels, um, Telegram, Discord, join the community on Discord, meet our ambassadors, meet our community members, builders, business founders, and we see you in the next one. Have a great day and thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye, Mario. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.